Thank you very much, Peter. I have to say, the kin organisers didn't really warn me that um, what I was going to be following. I feel a bit like the very boring bit of biscuit at the bottom of the cheesecake. You know, you have the wonderful fruit at the top, which was the, the cooking lesson, and then the wonderful violinist, Ade, who's the, the full cheesecake, and then I'm afraid you've got to the dull stuff at the bottom of the cheesecake. Moreover, as a diplomat, um, one, of the, one of my favourite dip definitions of a diplomat is a man who thinks twice before saying nothing. <laughs> and at the very least, I would like to persuade you that I'm, that I'm not that sort of diplomat. Someone has removed the pointer from here. Help. Sorry about this. Anyway, let me... Um, I'm, I'm talking about... Well, uh, Peter has given me 20 minutes to do energy, climate, the universe. So this is going to be a very quick run-through... And I'm going to start off saying a few things which you know very well already. That's world energy prices since 1861. Um, the, point I put, the reason I put this up is to draw your attention to where we are now. We're living in a world of very high energy prices. We tend to forget it since it's been running since, since the, the, the late 2000s. But we are living in a rather different world from the previous couple of decades. And it is with the consequences of that largely, that I'm going to be dealing in the course of my talk. Now, it's an interesting question, why are energy prices so high? Um, energy uh, consumption is flat in, here, in, here in the United States. Energy consumption is flat in Europe, in developed economies. And the answer is, it's developing economies where the energy consumption is rising. That's, as you say, consumption over the last few years. Non-OECD shooting up has now overtaken OECD consumption. That's where the action is, and particularly in China. If you want to look at the world of tomorrow, look at China today. China's energy consumption is going up by about 6% a year, um, and that is what's driving the energy world in which we live. Now, there's been a lot of talk about changing energy type, about the emergence of renewables, particularly in Europe where I come from, the growth of nuclear, all of that. Over the period of the next 10, 20 years that we're talking about today, I'm afraid that's not going to make a lot of difference. That's where we are now. Natural gas, petroleum, coal dominating the scene. Hydroelectric, all the others uh, remain very, very minimal. And the expectation, if you read the BP projection for the next 20 years, is that it remains, it grows a bit, but it remains uh, pretty, pretty minimal. Why? Well, the, the brutal answer to that is price. Gas, oil, coal remain much, much cheaper than the renewable alternatives. Nuclear did briefly show its head, uh, and there were suggestions that nuclear was going to become competitive, particularly in the context of climate change. I will come back to climate change in due course. Um, I have rather a lot of experience, I have to say, of the nuclear industry. I was working in Brussels at the time that Chernobyl blew up and spent an extremely tough negotiation. All of these arguments in Brussels turn, about, turn into arguments about prices and food exports and things. Um, into a negotiation where it became very, very clear that the nuclear and the non-nuclear worlds don't talk to each other. The world just about got over the trauma which Chernobyl uh, caused, which basically froze out global nuclear investment for a couple of decades, when, of course, we had the tsunami a few years ago in Japan. Fukushima reproduced, in many ways, what happened in Chernobyl. Um, and I suspect we're now in another deep freeze for another 20 years. Certainly, if you look at the nuclear plans... In Japan, where they're actually closing them down. Germany, they're closing them down. China, where they're slowing up the, the nuclear investment. I suspect we're not looking in the near future at a nuclear world. So we are looking at a world which continues to be dominated by the big uh, fossil hydrocarbons. Now, there is a big change, of course, in that world. And it's here in the United States that that change has happened with the emergence of shale gas and now what, what's come affectionately to be known as, 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 as tight oil. Um, which indeed does look like a, a, a game-changer here in the United States. It's now confidently predicted the United States shale gas has moved from 1% of production in the year 2000 to 46% expected by the year 2030, where we're moving towards a world where the United States will be self-sufficient in oil and gas. And that's where I want to begin as I think about the political implications of energy, because, of course, a lot of the justifications for the United States' involvement in, in particular, that graveyard of political hopes, the Middle East, um, has been the United States' dependence on the global oil markets and the United States' dependence on uh, stability in the Middle East. I'm going to come back to the Middle East, but that dependence is now 
diminishing, and various brave commentators have started suggesting that the United States is going to disengage from looking after global sea lanes, looking after global security in some sense. Now, there's a worry there, without doubt. And as I look at the performance of the Obama administration with regard to the war in Syria, there is a clear and <laughs> entirely comprehensible taste for not getting involved in yet another Middle Eastern mess. I suspect the suggestions about how much the United States is going to dis disengage are exaggerated. Um, as I was saying at a session this morning, anyone who's worked in um, Washington for more than a nanosecond, as I did, knows the salience of Israel in US domestic uh, politics. Israel remains there. Threatened is probably the wrong word for what Israel is, but challenged is undoubtedly the right word. And the US political interest is bound to remain because of that. The US imports a lot of things other than hydrocarbons, so the US is not going to disengage completely. But a diminished US interest in the Middle East, I think, is already apparent and is going to continue. And it's going to be interesting to see who replaces the US in terms of interest in the Middle East when we get there. Um, so there is that shift already in global politics as the US can readjust, has the comfort of readjusting its position with regard to salient issues like the Middle East as it becomes less and less dependent upon the outside world for energy supplies. Um, let me move on from the US and its potential disengagement to a place which I've already mentioned, Russia. Russia is the world, oh, sorry, I should have said this, um, oil exporters, the Middle East remains prominent, but Russia is now up there. Indeed, that's an old slide. Russia is now the world's leading uh, oil exporter. But the Middle East is going to be where it is in the future. If you look at that, that's where the reserves are, setting aside the prospects for tight oil. The Middle East, even though America can, dis can, can, can afford to diminish its interest, the rest of the world, us in Europe, cannot. So let me, go, let me turn to Russia and let me show you... Uh, there's shale. Sorry, I'm to press on from that. And there's shale again. And the reason I draw that to your attention is because look where the big blobs are, and look in particular at the big blob by China. That's where potentially vast shale deposits are. And as I come to China, I will talk a bit more about, about those. But let me first of all talk about Russia. And let me come back to this graph, because for those amongst you who are Marxists, maybe not many of you, you can trace <laughs> all of Russian history in the last portions of this graph. What you're looking at here, the, com the collapse of global oil prices in the early 1980s, is the collapse of communism. The Russian system fell because oil prices fell catastrophically and Russia could not afford to pay its way in the world. What you're looking at here is the bumpy Gorbachev and then Yeltsin years um, when Russia was broke. Russia was very dependent on the West for support as it staggered through the post-communist era. You're looking at a rough time for Russia, but actually rather a comfortable time for the rest of us in the world, because Russia was no trouble. We could go ahead and expand NATO, fight our war in Kosovo, all of that, while Russia was quiescent because they needed the money. And then, the end of the 1990s, arrives Putin, lucky man, simultaneously with the soaring in oil, oil, world oil prices, which explains where Russia now is, and how difficult Russia has now become. There's a famous global phenomenon, phenomenon called the oil curse, which says that countries whose governments are not very dependent upon their peoples for their incomes can run pretty autocratic, nasty governments. And Russia is a very conspicuous example of the oil curse. As long as oil was cheap, it had to at least to some extent go along with the democratic game. Oil becoming expensive, the Russian regime can now manage Russia much more in the way that it likes to manage it, and also become a great deal more difficult for the rest of us. Since Mr. Putin has come to power, we've had, well, the, 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 the Georgia war, to pick a particular example. We've had a much more troublesome Russia on Syria, on Iran, on a lot of global problems. And this is a, a very direct way that global energy activity plays into global politics. It has freed up Russia to play a much more troublesome role internationally than it previously did, and hence my wish expressed earlier that we need to find a way to reintegrate Russia into the civilized society. This is a European country, 
This is a country which gave us Dostoevsky and Tolstoy. This is not a country which should be governed in the way that it is being governed. This is a country which we have every interest in helping through. Now, Russia's rise to troublesome global independence again has had two rather interesting side consequences. One of these, if I can get this to work, which I think I... Yes. Let us turn our attention a long way north to the Arctic, an area which nobody much bothered about um, up until really quite recently. It was, as I described it this morning, a sort of little bijou international problem. There was no interest there. Nothing was going on. Nobody had any serious investments there. Um, and it was run by this very nice, sweet international body, the Arctic Council, which, because there were no interests at stake, actually ran in a relatively civilized, sensible way. The Arctic is changing as a result of climate change, another issue I will come on to quite quickly. And that is a graph of the average monthly ar Arctic sea ice extent over the last 30, 40 years. And you see that it is going down very fast indeed. This is a direct consequence of climate change. Suddenly, the Arctic, the oil and gas reserves in the Arctic, which are huge, are becoming accessible in a way that they were not before. Suddenly, the Arctic sea routes which dramatically shorten the distance from Europe in particular to, to, to the Pacific, are also becoming available. Uh, two years ago, one oil, uh, one oil supertanker, I don't, I don't think oil, one cargo supertanker made its way around the so-called Eastern Passage around Russia and down to Japan. Last year, 40 did. You said the world suddenly has a new sea route. There are new major interests out there. And the Arctic is a problematic place. There are um, unresolved border disputes out there. There's an unresolved legal regime out there. There is, as I say, this, this Bijou International Organization supposed to be governing it, but which we don't know if it has the strength to do so. So the Arctic is going to be one very interesting test in the, forth in the, in the immediate future of Russia's evolution in international society and how international society can handle the emerging global problems as a result of climate change. The other interesting feature of Russia's re-emergence is Russia's relationship with China. Um, China, of course, as I say, is the elephant in the room with regard to global energy demand in the future. Uh, barring the prospect of the development of shale, which is going to be slow in China as it's going to be slow in Europe because we don't have the technology yet, we don't have the, um, the exploration record, all of that. China has had something like 40 shale wells drilled in all of its history. As someone said to me, they drill that many in North Dakota every 10 days. There's an awful lot yet left to be done in China. And in the meantime, China is sucking in oil and gas at a huge rate more and more every year. Where is, where's it getting it from? It's buying it all over the place. It's buying up Angola. It's um, taking a lot from Venezuela. But the obvious place for it to get, for it, to get it from is Russia. Russia has vast reserves in East Siberia, right next door to China. Um, Russia has just completed its first oil pipeline to China and pre-sold $20 billion worth of oil to China. There is talk of a gas pipeline and the pre-selling over the next decade of a trillion dollars worth of gas. Now, I draw your attention to this prospect because, of course, in the world we live in, coming together of material economic relations tends to be followed by a coming together of political relations. And there could not be, in a way, a more major geostrategic coming together of two countries than that between Russia and China. By way of reassuring you, there are lots of difficulties. So Russia has lots of nervousness about China, nervousness about China reclaiming lands taken from it in the 19th century, nervousness about China, Chinese influence in, the, in, in, Central, in Central Asia. Nevertheless, there is a very real prospect of dramatic political shifts in that region, and that is something to watch out for going forward. OK, we've done Russia. We've done China. Let me now turn to the, the, the climax of the piece, the Middle East. Um, the world is an increasingly democratic place. It's not something that we really we, we, has, been, has been trumpeted very much, but this is a graph of the number of democracies there are in the world since 1900. Started off very low, big boost after, of course, the Second World War, where the good guys won, then flattened out for a bit, and then a big boost again with the fall of communism in 1980 and so on. Flattening out, actually, again now. Um, I put that there to draw your attention to the Middle East as the area which up until two years ago was the vast exception to this trend. As the rest of the world discovered the attractiveness of electing its governments and of having 
answerable government. It was the Middle East, it was the Arab world that was left behind. Of the 24 members of the, of the Arab League, up until a couple of years ago, 16 were firmly autocratic. Uh, and a couple were very, very questionable in there if you put them into the, into the democratic column. This was an area which was basically in aspic while the rest of the world in political terms moved on. Why? The oil curse, again. This was an area whose rulers either had oil revenues and therefore didn't have to pay any attention to the attitudes of its people, or um, was getting money from countries which did have oil even though they didn't have any themselves. So look at Egypt, it was getting money from remittances. Look at Saudi Arabia, it of course had the oil. Now, you will all vividly remember that a couple of years ago arrived the Arab Spring. This began to shift. Those of us who have advocated democracy and have said this is coming, I was involved here in Washington at the time of the Iraq War, and part of the background to the follow-up to the Iraq War was precisely a move, even by, the, uh, even by President Bush, to encourage democracy in the Arab world. We were all pretty uninspired by the results until the end of 2010, beginning of 2011, when suddenly this took off and we saw vast popular results in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen, in Bahrain, in Kuwait. Suddenly, the whole region seemed to be changing. Now, that's gone out of the headlines since, um, not because it's finished. It's unfinished business, undoubtedly, in, in, in Egypt. Uh, there are still a lot of bubbling under the surface in places like Bahrain, in Jordan and in Kuwait, um, and it's still very actual in terms of its pressure on the regimes concerned and in terms of its potential to play into much wider, um, much wider events. And if you think the oil price is high now, as I've said, you watch what happens when the re if the regime in Saudi Arabia falls. Um, and as a result, those regimes have worked rather hard at... Um, trying to keep their populations under control. They've essentially done that by throwing money at them. Uh, and this is now, this is what you might term the supply side price of oil in a range of, 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 of Arab countries. You're looking at the, the minimum price of a barrel of oil which covers their government expenditure every year because, um, because they've boosted social spending and all the rest of it to a level that um, uh, pleases, or at least appeases, or at least keeps quiet most of their people. And one rather firm conclusion that you can draw from this is that if, as a result of shale, or as a result of anything else, the oil price does fall significantly, then a lot of these regimes are going to be in very deep trouble indeed. Or, if I can put it the other way around, all of these regimes, members of OPEC, people who have substantial, although not total, control over global oil prices, um, have a very strong interest in keeping the price above $100 a barrel. I personally think that they will succeed, but then I come from a long tradition of seeing predictions about the global energy price being falsified one after another after another. Um, but this is something which you're very much going to have to follow, because if, as I say, the prices do fall significantly, if these regimes do find themselves unable to sustain the social spending that they've now committed themselves to, then we are in a deeply unstable world indeed. Okay, so having cheered you up about the Middle East, <laughs> let me move on to climate change. I have to say, I spent some of the most depressing years of my life sitting in unlit rooms in Geneva negotiating about climate change. I have prepared a slide for your delectation. This is a patent slide. That is Tony Brenton's patent graph of the history of the climate change negotiations. We started off back here, 1987. Uh, we were a very small band in those days. Nobody believed in it. Um, but the science was coming together. Um, suddenly, politicians were waking up to the fact that we had a problem. We, went, we got together, I was leading the British negotiating team, which took us to the Rio summit in 1992, the Earth Summit, where we did the first deal and came away feeling very good about ourselves that we had saved the planet. Of course, we hadn't. Nobody did what they committed themselves to, to, to do in Rio. And the whole thing slid down until a scientific report gave us a kick in the behind in 1995, which actually, with the arrival of President Clinton here, it has to be said, gave us a very substantial push towards a much more um, ambitious agreement the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, where I was also there. I watched Al Gore phoning Bill Clinton from a telephone box outside the negotiating room uh, to 
to get his consent to the deal that we finally did. OK, we then came away again, feeling good about having saved the planet. And again, the whole thing then slides, slides away. Problems getting Kyoto to enter into force. I, mean, I don't want to go into all the, all the gory detail of this. And here we are, another scientific report. We try again, and we push ourselves forward. This is the famous Copenhagen meeting where uh, Barack Obama found himself being hectored by a deputy Chinese minister of the environment in, the, in a cellar in, in Copenhagen. Durban putting the agreement together. You know, it, it feels pretty good again in terms of the bits of paper that are being produced. Uh, but again, it is very hard to be confident that even if we do get a deal up there, there's not going to be another dissent. We've been negotiating about this subject now for coming on for 30 years. In the course of those 30 years, um, the, the, the level of global, emissions, of global emissions of carbon dioxide has gone up by 45%. So it has to be said, if you're looking for an example of a failed global negotiation, and I, I'm, I put a lot of effort into this, uh, but if you have to look for an example of a failed global ex uh, uh, negotiation, this is it. And one, there are two core reasons why it's been so problematic. One, I'm afraid, is the United States itself. It is extraordinarily difficult for even committed US politicians, presidents, to persuade the American people to, to accept expensive energy, which is fundamentally what all this is about. And even when the US signs agreements, as they did the Kyoto Protocol, I was actually at the lunch where Condi Rice came along and told us all we were Europeans, that agreement was dead on the table with the arrival of George W. Bush. So there's a, there's a US difficulty, but the real difficulty, and increasingly the more and more important difficulty, is the developing country difficulty, and in particular the Chinese difficulty. The Chinese view is that the ordinary Chinese person is about a thir as third as rich as the ordinary American. The ordinary Chinese person has as much right to be as rich as the ordinary American as the American does. China is going to pursue its development goals until it reaches that, uh, that point. And with China, and it's not just China, of course, it's the whole of the developing world, in effect taking that position, the prospects of our getting global emissions seriously under control in the foreseeable future remain very, very low. I don't, let's see it how it is. Um, and that's a pity, because climate change, uh, I mean, there are all sorts of examples that I can give you. I, I should have said this at the beginning. I was slightly disappointed this morning as we got into a discussion on this that there were one or two people in the room who questioned the science. Now, there are problems about the, the fringes of the science, but the core science, there is no debate at all. Climate change is real. The world is already about a degree warmer than it was in pre-industrial times. The oceans are already about 20 or 30 centimeters deeper than they were in pre-industrial times. I've shown you what's happening to the Arctic ice. In the UK, a small example, but I think quite a compelling one, we erected a barrier on the Thames River to keep out flood surges, which we expected to use at the time we put it up, um, about once every three years. We now use it six times a year. That's immediate, that's now. This is happening. And the global political system is plainly inadequate in its present level of development to tackle that problem. So where does that leave us? I want to end on a... On a on a, on a more cheerful note, as I've run over all these ghastly points. <laughs> so I'm going to show you, you, some of you may know, oh yeah, there's the Chinese emissions coming up. I want to show you a picture of a nice man. Some of you may know him. Russ George, he's a, I think a California entrepreneur, who a couple of years ago filled a boat with iron filings, sailed down to a, a plankton bloom, and dumped his iron filings on the plankton bloom to the immense rage of the world environmental community. What's going on here? What's going on here is that clever people have come up with a couple of techniques of geoengineering, of ways by which we can manipulate the global climate without relying on these impossible negotiations to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. One is, and this is what Russ George was after, one is one of the constraints on plankton growth is lack of iron. You supply plankton with iron, the plankton grows and plankton eats carbon dioxide. And you get carbon well, global carbon dioxide down that way. An alternative, well, there are lots of alternatives mirrors in space. I mean, some of them are completely balmy, painting every roof on the planet white. But the other one, which I actually find even more attractive, is if you spray sulfur dioxides in the upper atmosphere, uh, that also reflects back sunlight and cools the planet down. And that actually is what volcanoes do. That's why the world cooled down measurably after the Krakatoa eruption. Anyway, there are a couple of techniques out there. And for the moment, they are reviled by the environmental movement and treated with great trepidation by almost all serious people. 
The point I would make is that if climate is as serious as we think it is, and if the negotiations are as stuck as I think they are, then increasingly this is going to be the only alternative. And you're suddenly looking at a very different sort of politics. Getting global carbon dioxide emissions down has to be a corporate global effort. You can't do it without all the big players, about 25 of them being involved. And I've just said China, for example, is not prepared to pull its weight yet. Geoengineering, you don't need the world to assent. It's not expensive. You could, you could put the sulfur up there for about a billion dollars a year. Russ George was going to do it all on his own. This can be done by any single major nation which decided that the world's climate was getting out of control and it wanted to do something about it. China finds its coastline threatened. It puts the planes up and puts the sulfur down. America decides that the droughts in the Midwest are no longer tolerable. Puts the planes up, brings the sulfur down. So you're, interesting, you're, you're entering potentially a very interesting phase where the climate change negotiation stops being about global cooperation and becomes about how do we control the ability of individual nation states to control the world's climate. Sounds like science fiction, but this is a world we're quite rapidly approaching. Let me close. I, I was encouraged to say a few words of why all of this should be of, of interest to business, which is what, where most of you are. And I've got four quick points I want to make here. The first is, while shale has been huge here in the United States, it is going to be much, much slower outside. So do not rely on China's shale or Europe's shale to fill in uh, for, for, for global hydrocarbon demand in the near future. It's going to happen. It's worth having money in there, but it's going to be much, much slower. My second is that there are very visible choke points in the, in the global energy system, which there has to be advantage in businesses getting involved in dealing with. And a very obvious one at the moment is gas to oil. There's lots and lots of oil, gas. Gas here at the moment is probably selling it cheaper than it costs to, to get out of the ground. Um, the big growth area in world hydrocarbon consumption is going to be, at the moment, oil, because transport fleets, uh, aviation fleets, all of that um, depend on oil. If someone can find a good, scalable way of turning all of that useless cheap gas into more expensive and more useful oil, that would be a major shift in the way we use energy and a major shift towards efficiency. My third point about climate, I've made it pretty clear uh, that the negotiations aren't going anywhere, uh, which means, th first thing, prepare to adapt. Put money into building seawalls. Put money into improving reservoirs. Put money into selling sunshades. The world is going to get warmer. We don't know by how much, but there's going to be a lot of business to be done in planning and delivering the scope to adapt to climate change. And then my fourth point, Geoengineering, I suspect, is coming. You come up with a technique which is acceptable to everyone, and you've got it made. Thank you very much. <laughs>